said, well, I guess we're not taking any action. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the joint workshop between the Board of County Commissioners from Marion County and Putnam County. We welcome you here to the BFW, and uh, again, a great host, and we thank you, Commander, for opening up and, and allowing us to be here. If you please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and the prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for a wonderful day, a day of opportunity to meet with our fellow commissioners and talk about things that are, are basically on our hearts and in our neighborhoods, Father, and we thank you for that. We ask that you guide us today, give us your wisdom today, give us your thought-provoking conversation, and Father, let us all just go out of here enthused and and prepared to build a better relationship. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Madam Clerk, if you'll call the roll for us. Yes, sir. Chairman Zalek. Here. Vice Chairman Bryant. Here. Commissioner Moore. Here. Commissioner Gold. Here. Commissioner Stone. Here. Uh, on the Putnam County side, too? Yes, sir. For Putnam County, I have Chairman Harvey. Here. Vice Chairman Goddard. Here. Commissioner Pickens. He's on his way. Commissioner Lytle. He will not be making it today, so he's got a prior engagement taking businesses around. But you can. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start off. I want to welcome everybody to the Great District 4. This is uh, my district, and as you well know, it's a, <laughs> it was a long ride. Thank you guys all for making it. So, uh, Except for everybody except for Jack, right, the local. This is the first time you've had a five-minute drive in a long time, huh? Come to a meeting, huh? <laughs> um, Commissioner Harvey, I just want to thank you. You know, uh, you approached me not too long ago, about, about maybe six, seven, eight months ago, about having a joint meeting, talking about some of the things we have in common, some of the things that we uh, have opportunity with, and, and just be neighbors and really kind of get together and have a conversation. And so uh, I appreciate your leadership in that and, and welcoming us. Uh, and again, welcome to Marion County District 4. Thank you. Thank you so, sir. Absolutely. Thank beautiful. you. All right, let the record show Commissioner Pickens has arrived. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Did you know that I'm late? <laughs> well, I would like to introduce our staff, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, starting over here, Tony Weaver with the Clerk of the Court for Putnam County, Stacy Manning, our County Attorney, Stacy Popel, our, our Budget Director and Acting County Manager right now. Over here in the front seat, Press Tompkins is our Public Works Supervisor. Uh, beside him is Yvonne Parrish, is our Public Information Officer. Uh, back here, Larry Gass is our Sanitation Director. <laughs> I forget, I, got, I lost your name, I'm sorry. Ryan Simpson, yeah, with the Emergency Management Center at, in Putnam County. And Quimro May is our Chief of Fire and EMS in Putnam County. Thank you for coming. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. we also have our County Attorney and County Administrator here, Mr. Buenas and Mr. Mitchell, respectively. We got a bunch of staff back them up as well in case we have any questions. So we need okay. uh, educated answers off. Good deal. So, uh, with that, I think we can move into the public comment. One of the things we wanted to do is to share time. If there was any, uh, any comment from the public, each person will have uh, three minutes. Um, so would anybody in the audience like to speak, come on up to the podium here, and you can address the collective boards. <coughs> My name is uh, Robin Lewis, and uh, I live at 23797 Northeast 189th Street in Salt Springs, Florida. So I'm a resident of Marion County. Thanks for being here today. Yes. I'm uh, president of Save Our Big Scrub, a small local organization supporting the Ocala National Forest. I also serve on the executive board of the uh, Putnam County Environmental Council. So I, I cross over, and I, my message to you today uh, is that there's room for cooperation, there's room for improvements to uh, ecotourism and water resources management that both counties can work on. And um, um, Karen Chadwick will talk briefly in a second about support for uh, the restoration of the Ocklawaha River. We know that's a controversial subject. Um, you're not going to make any decisions about it today, obviously, and you're going to hear both sides. I wanted to show you the map. You've got every one of you has got one of these maps in front of you. Uh, this is an example of the kind of things that we can do together. This is a Felburn Foundation funded map of the lower Ocklawaha River. And um, 
it's, it's interestingly enough, the lower Ocklawaha River below the Kirkpatrick Dam is in both counties. There's portions of it in Marion County and portions of it in Putnam County. And this map is an example of the kind of thing that can be done in terms of resource management. And we are actively working um, to improve the boat ramp at uh, Johnson Field. Uh, many of you know along uh, State Road 19, right there at the Ocklawaha River, there's a boat ramp and it's got some problems. It's a little, uh, it really isn't friendly for boaters. It's difficult to launch, it's difficult to retrieve. We're working on an active plan to look at improving that, and that's a, a Putnam County Environmental Council project. Um, but there are other projects along this area, paddling projects, fishing projects, all available for cooperation between um, Marion County and Putnam County because it's a jointly owned resource, jointly managed resource. And finally, I would like to close by saying, particularly for those of, uh, of you from Marion County, the one thing that would happen with restoration of the Ocklawaha River is the return of the populations of uh, manatees. Um, manatees were not too common in Silver Springs historically because they were hunted, but they would return. There are a few that get through the Buckman Lock and come up. There's an estimated 200 manatees that would come up uh, with restoration. And from an economic viewpoint, I would ask you to think about, for both Putnam and Marion County, imagine having a, uh, an annual manatee fest like they have down in Tampa and a few other places, Homosassa Springs, because manatees would return to Silver Springs and it would be a wonderful tourist attraction and be a wonderful economic benefit to both Marion and, and to Putnam County. And that's certainly a great possibility that could come with restoration. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Anyone else? Um, Karen Chadwick. Uh, 179 Strickland Road in Interlochen and um, I, yeah I just wanted to uh, thank the people that uh, from Putnam County that came out to the Duns Creek Earth Day celebration that that was great to see you all out there I know um, Commissioner Leibel was out there and you were there and um, hopefully we'll get bigger and better every year people are drove all the way from Orlando and Jacksonville to go to that so that was nice to see um, and I just wanted to say if it ever comes about that the Ocklawaha River does get restored, there is a lot of support for that. Um, we don't get a voice too much, um, but there is a lot of support for that during the drawdown. There are a lot of people that go out there that, that go out to see all the, the wildlife. As a matter of fact, this picture on the um, Rubman Reservoir, Save Rubman brochure I just got, this is a picture from during the drawdown, and this is the kind of birds that you'll see. You don't see that now. You'll see a few here and there, but they're just not out there like that unless the water's down. And you'll see a lot more alligators, turtles. That's why the people, the paddlers and the people, uh, the bird watchers go out there. And people are fishing like crazy too. There's um, the vehicle numbers <clears throat> at, at Eureka and Orange Springs and Kenwood, they're like tournament numbers all week long. A lot more people go out there. And uh, so I just wanted to make sure you know what's um, in Marion County in particular. Now, a lot of people went from Putnam County during the last drawdown and the one before. This is Cannon Springs. This is what it looks like during the drawdown. I don't have a photo of it now because um, my printer quit. But what it looks like now is just it's browned out. It's getting filled up with algae. It's getting covered up with water lettuce again. It looks nothing like this at all. And this was a big attraction. Well, every drawdown, it's, it's a big attraction, and it's getting more and more popular. <clears throat> I did During the drawdown, I did a whole series of these um, to show my feet are on the, the high water line. This is down towards um, about three miles north of Eureka. And that whole area down there, most of where Marion County abuts, you have to stay in the river until you get up almost to um, Orange Springs, then you can start go, going up in the shallower areas when the water's up. But, I mean, you can't, this is how high the water is. That's like about 10,000 acres of wildlife habitat that's flooded. And when you walk along the shoreline, when the water's down, you see all kinds of tracks, all kinds of animals um, are walking along and getting a drink. Um, that could be um, increased hiking and uh, hunting. I'm not a hunter, but people could hunt out there. It's just, um, there's a lot that's, it's just flooded. It's, it's not usable. 
Um, also, the um, herbicides are a concern for some of us. I know right now at Orange Springs, they just sprayed 5,000 acres out in front of Orange Springs because the, the wind blows those tussocks and the floating mats up and the Orange Springs ramp is just unusable. And so they just sprayed 5,000 acres there. Uh, Mickey Thomason told me the largest area a couple years ago they sprayed was a three mile stretch all the way from, and I saw it, I got pictures of all of it, from the bridge all the way down towards Orange Springs. It was a huge area of water lettuce that was all um, matted together from the dollar weed, um, <coughs> just weaving it all together. Um, so there's a film, I just want, want to make sure you all know about this. It's called Lost Springs. It's by uh, Matt Keen and Margaret Tolbert. She's an international artist and she did a lot of paintings of the different springs, um, Cannon Springs and Tobacco Patch, uh, Catfish. Uh, I don't think she did any with Blue Springs, but there's 20 springs that are submerged, which you know most everyone knows that looks into this sort of thing. So um, it's uh, June 23rd. There's a screening at the Matheson in Gainesville, and I have um, invitations. I want to give one to all of you. There's a, there's there's the Save Ramen side, and then there's the restore people, and I don't expect to convince anybody of anything. I'm not going to be convinced that keeping it like it is is a good idea, but I just you know, want us to have our voice too and, and make sure you all know what's missing because people are not going out there to see this the way it is now. It looks, it looks terrible. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. I appreciate it. Anyone else? Just one day. Jack Stackman, 15109 Northeast 248 Avenue Road, over yonder. <coughs> it's nice to talk with you without a yellow and red light. So I got it up here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to dwell on Rodman, uh, the environmental knowledgeable people, much better than I. I support bombing that dam and getting rid of it. Um, I, I know that my commission seems to be indifferent to it. I believe Putnam wants to keep it. A couple comments, and, and I'd like for you guys to address perhaps later in the meeting is what your motive is for keeping Rodman. Um, I have heard, you know, I'm not a scientist or environmentalist, but I've heard that the evaporation from Rodman is just, we, we lose hundreds of thousands of gallon of water every day through evacuation. I've also heard people speculate that Rodman might be the cause of some of our low lake levels in this area. Again, I've just heard that speculation. Moving on, motive for Rodman. To the Putnam County Commissioners, what is the reason for paving Fort Gates Road, the ferry road? I assume you'll talk about that later. And another question I guess I have for you is, what is your county doing or have already done regarding cannabis dispensaries? Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else in the poll that to speak before we get? No? Okay. Yes, my name is Kevin Sapp. <clears throat> I live in the community of Norwalk. And our roads out there has been really bad for years and years. We've got a lot of disabled people out there. Some's even homebound, can't get out. Um, me and Melba, we've worked for years and years with the county. Um, we got with Chip. He's helped us out a time or two. Walton helped us out, Palisir. He turned it over to the county. We've had really great success with that. The county's been great. Then we found out they turned it back over to the Forestry Service, and we want to know why. So, I mean, y'all was great when we had it. We need it. We need them roads keep kept up for people that can't get out of their house. We got some people out there that the male people has to go to their house to deliver mail. They can't even get out. We need them roads kept up real good. And we want to know why. 
I'm Melba Knowles. I live out by where uh, SAP does. And we work with the Forest Service and got the road widened, got uh, where it was so flat that it was so sandy and they did bring in the clay and everything. We don't want lime rock. The clay was brought in, the road was made really, really good, had the runoffs. We don't want it turned back over to the Forest Service. Now the Forest Service worked with us. They also let them cut the limbs on both sides of the road so that they wouldn't hurt the scratch of cars and stuff. And we really don't want it turned back over. We want it left in Putnam County where we live. We are Putnam County. We represent it, <laughs> our end of it. So, like I said, I don't know. Y'all need to turn it back over to the Forest Service. I knew the guy that, uh, Steve, I worked with him. I do not know the new guy that took his place. I'd like to meet him. But, and now, I understand that Mr. Goddard is our commissioner. And I hope to work hand in hand with him so that we can keep it good because all of the old people out there have small cars. And before, it was like a sand bed until they brought the clay in. And way back, even we had Thompson, we had Brad Purcell, we've had all these county commissioners and Walton and all of them. And we've, I've worked with all of them out there to keep the road. And I don't want it back like it was because I don't know who grades it, but whoever they got the last two times, I don't think Putnam County graded it. It's flattened back out and that's not good. And they did not do the runoffs either. Like you can see, if you go out there, you can see the old runoffs that was there that keeps, you know, the water and the road, it keeps it good. And I'm not sure, Mr. Goddard, I guess you were out there the other day, wasn't you? And you saw how good it was. So when we went, got together with the Forest Service and all, that's when we got it widened two feet on each side of the road to make it where two cars could pass before you couldn't. So that's why I'm here. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. And, and I'd love for it to stay in Putnam County. Okay? <coughs> Anyone else in the public like to speak? Thank you, commissioners. Uh, I'm Whitey Markle. I'm the chairman of the Swanee St. John Sierra Club. We take this whole end of Florida. Our group covers uh, an area the same size as Massachusetts, so we have a lot of issues. But I live in Citra. Okay, if you'll just give your address for the clerk. 1981 Northwest 186 Place, Citra. Thank you. And um, I voted for you. That's a smart move. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to move? <laughs> no. Because I voted for you. No, your vote was a smart move. <coughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm getting older. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about two things. One, we'll talk about Rodman for a minute, because I know that's not the subject of the day. but. It only makes good sense economically to get rid of that dam and restore that river. That river should have been restored after the Clean Water Act in 1972. This is 45 years since the federal government said restore the river. The dam is absolutely useless. The water in that pool is stagnant. It's not drinking water. That's a myth. Um, about $200,000 a year to maintain the pool if you remove the dam and restore the river, you won't have that overhead anymore at all. It sounds like a pretty good rate of return. To me, zero is pretty good. Um, they did a $150,000 study out there, and it, it said that the dam needs $2 million in repairs. That's not a good rate of return. 
So economically, it looks like a good deal to restore the river. You'll increase fishing, bank fishing, 20 more miles around that pool because that'll fill in and you'll have that much more bank fishing. Uh, plus the kayakers and the birders and all the... I was at a FWC meeting in Tallahassee. We stopped the bear hunt, by the way, uh, last week. And Commissioner Bergeron is one of our heroes and uh, he said he had three magnets pulling at him. One was the politicians, one was the hunters, and the other one was what he called the animal lovers. And that's us, the animal lovers and the tree huggers. We're proud to be animal lovers and tree huggers. So we like to go out into those areas, especially in restored areas where there's a revitalization of animal life and bird life. So all those advantages come along with it. Plus, if you remove the dam, you're going to get a re migration of striped bass and that's another industry in itself snowbirds love to fish for striped bass and they'll come in and they'll buy gasoline in Putnam County and they'll buy it in Marion County they'll buy the hotels they'll buy the restaurants I know you know the story um, now let's talk about Silver Springs I don't know the details of what the plan is hopefully I'll know by the end of this meeting what the plan is but the Silver Springs Alliance, which I'm on the board of, we held meeting after meeting after meeting with public input, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, administrations of the agencies involved in that. And overwhelmingly, we said no motels in that park. That's what that data said, and it's still around. It didn't disappear. So I don't know what your plan is. I don't know what the land trade is. I don't know any of that because I don't know the details but we are overwhelmingly against anything like that. If you want a convention center, you're gonna to have to put it somewhere else. There's plenty of land, but don't put it on that beautiful Silver Spring. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, we'll bring it, we'll bring it back to the boards. <clears throat> Before we get started, Mr. Harvey, Chairman Harvey, a uh, couple information pieces about some roads. I don't know if you wanted to have any of your people speak on anything? We can address that when we get down to okay. our topics. Okay. So on transportation? Right, and on so um, ecotourism, I want to bring something up on that too. Uh, but we can address those issues then at that point. All right, so we have a couple of discussion items. We'll start off then um, with solid waste. Uh, Commissioner Stone is actually our liaison for the solid waste uh, regional um, regionalization project. Um, so, Commissioner Stone, if you'll start, off, start our discussion off with uh, an update for Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so thankful that you've taken your afternoon to be with us. And uh, commissioners of Putnam County, we appreciate you all being here this afternoon as well. Um, we are in discussion right now. Um, I'm sure you've had a chance to look over the attachment. But we've been looking at our long-range planning for solid waste. And we are looking to form a um, solid waste regional authority. <coughs> There's been some conversation um, with Alachua County, and we are in the process of conducting a survey at this point and some data collection that will actually assess all of the assets in this area in the 100 mile radius for solid waste collection um, in the various counties associated in that 100 mile radius at this moment to find out what may be available, as well as then making a decision on how to move forward. Um, that's to get it started. Um, we understand that Putnam County uh, may have some interest, so uh, we're hopeful that you may have some interest in learning more about that as well. So the status, uh, maybe the update, so the status of our landfill, we have about uh, five years left, Mike, somewhere in there, four years left, we're, get, we're counting down um, in, in our current landfill, and then we're going to be transporting to the heart of Florida, the heart of Florida, we, we signed a basically a 20 plus year deal with them, um, and so one of the things that we looked at is, um, it, you know, instead of having a 20 or 30 year deal, it's always great and solid waste to plan you know, 50 plus years, make sure that you have a home for that garbage if you can. And uh, so one of the things Commissioner Stone is working on is looking at um, could a, a, um, a group of uh, public entities bond their their flow and buy the landfill to turn it into a regional 
landfill uh, from some of the surrounding towns. So, counties or municipalities or whoever's interested in doing that kind of thing. Mr. Chairman, we brought our solid waste director, if sure. you don't mind. Um, Mr. Gass, would you like to come up? Actually, we have more than 50 years of planning in our landfill. Oh, that's good. So, um, so you guys are going to say. Mr. Gass can explain what we current, what the asset of Putnam County's landfill currently looks like. Well, currently we have enough uh, currently permitted to go 50 years, and then we've got another 45 years expansion on top of that. So for Putnam County, we're good for a good 95 years. Uh, all of that's not constructed, but that is what the uh, plans have been approved by DEP. Mr. Gass, how many acres do we have out there at our landfill currently? Right now, we've got a little over 1,500 acres. And how many are we using currently? Currently, we're using a little over 130. And we're approved for how high? Uh, it's about 110 feet above base, uh, base land grade. And you only, you only accept um, material from your county? Or? At this time, yes. What's the gate rate? It's $44 a ton. What's your, what's your cost of there? That's a difficult question to answer. A good one to know. Because, <laughs> because like, like you, we uh, have an expense for um, convenience centers that we operate throughout the county. I know you guys have a lot of recycling centers that that cost cost quite a bit to maintain. Just the cost to move that material from the collection centers to the landfills over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So that artificially drives up that cost of disposal. Uh, we're looking by the time you take out for long-term care, uh, straight operations. Uh, we're running at a deficit right now. We could increase, we could double our rate that we are taking in, double the tonnage, and the only increased cost that we would really have is our fuel. That's for our manpower equipment, things like that. Um, because at the rate that we're currently accepting, uh, we got to man it whether there's anything coming in or not for the hours that DEP specifies. So we do have a little bit of slack time that could be taken up with additional waste that comes in. <laughs> and you guys are actually, are you guys bid in the Alaska County waste too? We did not do that. No. 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 But we did, the board gave you a directive a year ago to go outside and start looking at outside garbage coming in. They said to, we could look at bringing in outside waste, but the board had to approve each right. deal that was brought forward. Uh, we've got a lot of interest in things like sludge, things like asbestos, uh, or biosolids and asbestos. Uh, you know, the Navy base and Army bases in uh, the northern part of the state uh, would like to be able to bring uh, friable asbestos to us, but we don't generate enough waste to handle a large amount of asbestos coming in because you've got to have waste to cover it with on a daily basis. and and we're not at that point yet. Especially it's a good market though. Yeah. Uh, it, it's so difficult. Just the transportation of special waste is so costly. That's why they want to try to find some place closer to get it to. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gass. We appreciate it. Any other questions? Any other comments, Mr. We're, we've got enough to handle what we've got for quite a bit of time into the future, and if we continue to expand throughout the 1,500 acres, 
we could probably go a couple of 300 years into the future at just what our county is is generating. But I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't say that we're, that's not what, hello, can you hear me? I wouldn't say we're not going to be interested in the future as we go forward. It's just right now, um, we've got a big asset out there, 17, 1800 acres, and um, it works for us, but we are looking for partners that can help us, you know, move that along a little bit. We don't want to be known as Mount Trashmore. The citizens have made that very clear. Uh, it is on one of our gateway four lanes coming in to Putnam County. Uh, but where it sits, uh, we, could, we could do some. We just couldn't. And I don't think the citizens want to enter into a huge, you know, regional landfill that protrudes up in the air too far. So, you know. so there is some limitations, I think. Is that, am I correct, Mr. Gaston? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <coughs> Commissioners, any other comments? All right. One of the other things, um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, we, we want to talk to you about was obviously that uh, Florida and the governor or ourselves have all been talking about some of the fire prevention and um, some of the forest fires that are occurring. And we had one that was just up in Orange Springs uh, a couple weeks ago and close to the Putnam County line. And one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that both of our communication systems hopefully are working together so that you know, both our teams could work together uh, if something you know protrudes in and out of it's very I would assume it's very easy for uh, some of these fires to be on both of our county lines mm -hmm. so uh, so we're si we got Chief Nevels he'll come up and address and Silas he's our 911 communications guy radios guy um, and if you have a radio guy or fire chief that'd be great we could bring up Ryan Simpson okay. and Chief Romay excellent Chief Nevels if you'll start us off sir and I think Chief Neville has a hand out. Okay, great. So, um, I think that was working. Good thing you did. But you did it. Watch. Watch. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bowen. Yes, sir. Would you lead us on this discussion? That would be great, please. <coughs> All right, very good. Uh, Putnam Commissioners, thank you for making the drive over here. Uh, one of the areas that we're looking at, obviously, we're, we have an area that is very close to each other, and we can see now with the conditions that we're probably going to run into some fire uh, dangers in the future. We just saw a couple weeks ago right by Commissioner Alex's house uh, where we had fires right on there. But what uh, Chief Nevels is going to discuss here is going to be an interlocal agreement uh, for mutual aid that we work with uh, several other counties, Sumter County uh, being one of the primary counties. And what it does is it speeds up the response, it speeds up the communications. And he'll explain it more in depth, but one of the things they'll do is it'll allow the on-scene incident commanders to go ahead and call directly for the mutual aid for the, from the counties that we have the agreement with. And that's, I believe, that's what we want to see is to be able to enter into a mutual aid agreement that we can both support each other, not just through fire, through EMS, emergency management, and also with some of the specialty teams that uh, we have and that your agency has, anything including from the hazardous materials teams to some of the rescue teams that might make it quicker and then also aid to the same area where we're able to communicate a lot better. Because we are starting to get into a world, finally, where agencies from different counties can communicate. So if we can get this in writing, I think it will be a great thing for us, and we'll be able to uh, save some lives and a lot of property. But Chief Nevels is going to go through briefly, or, or as much detail as you need, the uh, mutual aid agreement and the importance it does that I do the Sir? Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, Commissioners. Thanks for having us. Um, appreciate uh, being here. My name is Paul Nevels, Fire Chief, Marion County Fire Rescue. Um, the, the history as far as this draft agreement that you have in front of you, um, for, for many years, fire rescue departments throughout the state um, have had mutual aid and automatic aid agreements. Um, typically, these are the kind of thing that gets kind of shelved or put to the back of the desk in the pile 
um, when we focus on other um, more timely priorities or things that are um, are happening right now that we must deal with. Um, certainly, the recession came up, came along and and put us that far behind. But we we've got agreements, you know, to be honest with you, that are in the CAD, um, the computer aid dispatch system that are dispatched. For instance, a good example is Putnam County, um, that we respond anywhere from every third day to maybe once a week to the area of Lake Delancey and across the Highway 19 from there to the residential areas for uh, these are typically EMS calls. Um, now and then we may have a fire or a disturbance or something like that that also Sheriff's Office goes. Um, that is the uh, typical, the, the main call that we go on. However, and uh, and looking back at back to our draft agreement, um, while we have been doing this like many other and touching our area um, of response, we have 1,640 square miles, so we have multiple counties and including Levy, Alachua, Lake. And while we've all been working very well together, including Putnam County, one of the things that we've made a priority is to, instead of putting these on the back shelf, is to go and assign somebody with that. We have assigned this with to a division chief uh, that we have a new, fairly new one. Um, really takes uh, care of business pretty well, and that's Drew Rogers. Um, so anyway, we have tasked him with working with the other departments to get these finalized and, and work together as much as we can, working together. Uh, much of this is things that we're already doing. Um, so the draft that you have in front of you is actually Sumter County, and their chief, um, Greek Leland, was uh, wanting to get theirs done this last year, so we partnered together with Sumter County and said, hey, let's work together on a draft that's that's fresh, it's not 10, 15, 20 years old, like a lot of the departments, like, we, like we've had as well. Um, let's freshen it up and make it new. One of the things that uh, you'll hear mutual aid agreement, and you also hear automatic aid agreement. The difference is mutual aid is something that is typically called for once you're on scene, uh, once an instant command or IC is on scene, or a commander or even somebody at the um, radio dispatch center. However, automatic aid is something that's already in place within uh, maybe not in writing, but maybe in it's, a, it's an agreement and it's in the computer aid dispatch system. It's very important to have automatic aid for our ISO, Insurance Services Office, for our taxpayers to get credit for that. It's all the difference in the world. They will not accept mutual aid is what we found through the years. So it's important to have these in writing if we can. And um, along with that, the, as far as the history of agreements, that's why we've been working on, on buttoning these up and trying to have some kind of common language with other um, departments that we're working with already. Um, one of the things that, um, of course, mutual aid and automatic aid agreements do for us all is, I mean, we already have the staff, both counties or whatnot, and we're already running the calls together, and it just behooves both counties to work together whenever there's a call on their side of the line that needs extra help, they call for us, and, and vice versa. And it lessens the burden, excuse me, the burden on the taxpayers and the departments on each side. One of those things like Commissioner Gold's talking about right now, especially getting into wildfire season, is calling on each other. Thankfully, Putnam County and Marion County enjoy having a large area of the National Forest, which the U.S. Forestry and the Fed, federal um, resources help us, or actually we help them often to take care of those areas. Um, along also with this, uh, this agreement here, or any agreement, it's, it's got like a basic um, a foundation or a format. However, we work together um, with whatever the uh, different types of units or equipment, or if it's a volunteer or if it's combination, which means volunteer and career, like we are. Um, we have both. Um, it works with both um, entities and as far as that level of training. So anyway, it's not um, when you take a look at this and also Ch Chief Romay, when you take a look at this, it's not like we're wanting to say, hey, well, this is the way it's got to be. You know, we want to sit down and work together as to uh, what works best for, for your department and, and your folks and your commission and uh, what works best for everybody. Um, and there again, it just takes into account each department's capability and um, what we can do for each other. Thank you. One of the uh, areas, too, that makes it, uh, the agreements goes to is it kind of defines the areas. Like, we're not, Marion County's not going to lose any control there. You have the incident commander who's for that area will remain that unless it goes into a different type or a federal target. It kind of outlines the direction that we might need in the future that Marion County will retain that, Putnam County will retain 
leadership in their area, but other places it also deals with is with the EMS field. And I see Chief, um, uh, we both understand that that's getting a little bit more complicated, but this still was outlines directly a question I had when I spoke to Chief Neville to retain the medical direction. What we do, and I actually read that in here that it you know falls because each one of our counties had a medical director, and that's how our paramedics and EMTs operate out there in the field. Is that but everything on these is well defined, but it's something that we can work together. And I would strongly recommend that we work together between Mary and Putnam to get this done, and we're going to continue to work with all the other counties in the area. Any other questions? Uh, have Silas or Commissioner Moore you know, after you've done it. And then uh, 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 Silas, if you kind of address us here real quickly and let us know if you could give us an answer on this. What's the uh, current, how are we right now able to communicate with the 800 system with other counties? With other counties, uh, right now we're relying on the Florida Interoperability Network. Um, it's a series of mutual aid channels that are set up statewide so that agencies with disparate systems can can connect, talk on the same channel and communicate with each other. Uh, it's my understanding the state it's of silence. Florida's. Speak up. I'm sorry. I've, There's not really a microphone. Oh, okay. Your big word voice. <laughs> sorry. I'm very I'm very soft spoken normally. Um, there's the Florida Interoperability Network, but it's my understanding the state of Florida is making some changes as far as how they're funding that, and they're actually decommissioning portions of that. Uh, so in the future, we're probably going to need to look at a better solution between us and our neighbors. Um, that would also fit hand in hand with regional 911 networks. Uh, as 911 technology advances, uh, it's becoming more and more practical for counties to join together. Uh, regions, so it makes it easier to transfer calls that end up in the wrong area, as well as share costs as far as infrastructure. Um, and then also, do we have the capability now with the new radio systems to put, and I'll have to ask uh, Putnam County, do you have the 800, you're in the 800 megahertz, correct, or you're still in the VHF? So, but we have actually started uh, our radios that we purchased. Um, are now dual band where we do have the VHS. So it's a thing that if we work out together, we may be able to put the church channels in there. Yeah. 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 That's what I was asking Silas the other day. But I wanted to, if we do a mutual aid or we don't, I still was hoping that both between our counties we could give our staff directions to test a mm -hmm. channel, a piece, a something awesome. to make sure that if we go on scene and we're north, we can let you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Same thing if you start getting the south. And near us, you guys can let us know what's going on. We have, we have something we've actually tested before. Instead of getting out in the field and trying to figure out what radio channel people are on and those kind of things. So, definitely, we're ready, willing, and able. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Zout, Chairman Harvey. We want your yeah. If you, if you guys can explain to us what you, what and what we can do to help serve as well. Absolutely. I'm chief from a uh, Putnam County Fire and EMS under Emergency Services, and. Uh, Chief Neville gave me a copy of the agreement. We've been, I have been working on a similar thing with some of our surrounding counties to the north and east and all of that also. So this is very timely. Uh, and also, Commissioner, this would, uh, I believe, work out the issue that you're, you brought up about communications channels because it does talk yes, about, you know, what, what we do and how we do it type thing. So I definitely think this is a very good uh, template to work on. And I, you know, I, I will hand this over to legal now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, I figured that, Mr. Chairman, what we could do, though, is, is actually have your legal review it, uh, let them look at it. If they want some adjustments to make those adjustments, send it back to us uh, once you guys codify it, and, and we can go from there. Yeah. And just, just one other point about our radio system. We're in a, a vintage VHF system that we've had uh, for quite a, quite a long time. Uh, I know the board is looking at and uh, has started this past year uh, working to uh, to enhance that system through some some changes and some some necessary repairs and, and things and there there is a proposal or a plan for a, a long-term fix to move to, to 800 but we also in our dispatch center we have a combined dispatch center at the sheriff's office that dispatches not only law all the law enforcement but but also fire rescue and they have that fin capability that he was he was mentioning where we can patch channels and and do that very same thing but this agreement actually would spell out okay 
of our 16 channels, this is the channel that goes, you know, so it would certainly be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. For Mr. Simpson, do you have any comments? No further comments. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mr. Chair. Commission? Mr. Chair. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to bring up an idea more to our board, but um, in times past we've helped out Levy County. We gave them a surplus fire equipment. Um, maybe if Putnam could, if you all don't mind telling us sometimes like, hey, if you have need of something and if we're about ready to surplus the same thing, maybe we might be able to, you know, cooperate and give some mutual aid that way, you know, provided you're not asking for like a million dollar fire truck. Just saying, we're not going to surplus our brand new stuff, but we need some of our older stuff. We might be able to help out in that way because we, we have been times past on this board helped out Levy in that same manner. So, and, go ahead, Mr. Chair. I, I, I certainly uh, appreciate that. We we do have uh, mostly all volunteer. We're just now I, prior to this, I we've got our ISO ratings going on now for a couple of our stations in the south end. So I was down there this morning working with them. But uh, equipment obviously is, is something that everybody needs. And, right. You know, certainly there's so, things that you may have that may be something new to us. Yeah, like if you all are short a brush truck and we're about ready to surplus one, maybe we could as a board, you know, bring it back to our board and vote on it. Because in, since I've been on the board, um, well, actually three of us, there's two new ones, but we, we had surplus something to Levy County. Maybe we could surplus something to you all if it's something that you, you could take and actually find use for, you know. And, you know, that way it would be beneficial because we are trying to cover some of the same areas, you know, so it's a mutual benefit. Commissioner Moore, also, uh, recently we just had water management donate some, some boats to us and to one of our volunteer stations. And uh, it took three boats to make one, but now they've got an airboat and they can do search and rescue in the West End or out throughout Putnam County, actually. So, uh, Anything y'all need from us, we're, we're there to help you too. I do have a question for Chief Nettles, if you don't mind. Well, okay. Um, He's there to serve you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me all right, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Chief, your, your career and volunteer fire service, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, we're just kind of now going into the, well, putting <coughs> career fire people in fire stations. Okay, um, we got kind of a hybrid over in the Melrose area where Lodgeville County put pays for two personnel over there. But Satsuma is going get, to get some paid people and East Palakka. My question to you is, um, how did that work for your department? How did that transition, did it go smoothly? Did it go, you know, I mean... I, my family's from fire service, so I know the question I'm asking, but I'm asking you, did it go smooth for y'all, and what could we do to make ours better, per se? Um, ours actually has been quite a long process, um, and, and most of it was just, it, it evolved over a period of, uh, I'd say around 1985, is around the time when we hired our first paid uh, employee. It was just a single cert firefighter. Um, I came aboard in 88, and I think I was badge 48. Um, at the time, we probably had 240 active volunteers. Um, as the culture has changed, and then at the same time, as the tremendous growth hit Marion County in the 90s, um, that is what, and the, the, the need for a call load, and we have 1,640 square miles. Um, and now we're up to 30 fire stations. 24 of those are career staffed. Um, they pretty much had to be career staffed and we slowly worked up from that. And about in 2001, we had a 10 year plan. Um, prior to that, it had been um, slow going and, and it was still um, pretty difficult because you have um, certainly volunteer stations that have a community. They've worked very hard. Um, they put in their lifeblood in it and um, a lot of it was just working together and um, looking I mean my opinion is uh, you can have professional people or professional on the way that they act on a daily basis certainly they got to have the minimum qualifications and that has changed through the years too it is it is much harder to to bring in volunteers 
in a different culture where people are working two or three jobs. A lot of people went back to work during the stock crash or then the recession. So that has made it um, more slim pickings, if you will. Also, the additional courses, even though we pay for them, we're down to around, it's under 30, somewhere around 24 active volunteers now. So um, a huge percentage of change. And then with the um, influx of, of, of residents and growth um, into the county, we're up to a total of 560 budgeted positions with um, a little under 500 of those being firefighters and EMS. We're fully ALS. We, we do all transport, ALS transport within Marion County and for the municipalities. Um, we, 46 of those positions are pure EMS, either EMT, but mainly paramedics. Um, so um, as far as the, the easiest answer to your question, it, it was a long road, to be honest with you, because there are a lot of folks that have, have worked very hard to have a station and respond to their community. And you, you do get into um, those areas and, um, and yeah, there, there can, were, were certainly challenges. Did I hear you say you have 30 volunteers out of, out of all your people now? 30 active. 30 a little active. under 30 active, yes, sir. I think our numbers are the opposite, aren't they? I, I believe they are. And that's, and that's where we <laughs> I think were. we're on that side of the, yeah. Yes, sir. And that's where we were. And as we went up through the call load, this last year we ran just under 75,000 calls for the county. And um, that was up 5,000 from the year before. Wow. And, of course, about 73 to 80% of that is EMS. And probably about 45, 46,000 of those were actually trans ended up resulting in a transport to a, to a facility. I see you mentioned that you had incredible growth here in Marion County. Yes, sir. We're not seeing that in Putnam. Yes, sir. So it's, you know, without the growth coming, it's hard for us to look at the cost of that. Funding. Yeah. How do you fund those stations that need to be funded properly? And it's difficult. It, it, it's very difficult. Yes, sir. Very difficult. I, what we end up is uh, it, 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 we try to define the need and let the citizens understand the need and let them know what the cost this is what you're paying now for what you're getting if you if you want to have a ALS unit or even a BLS unit or a first response unit like an a, a ALS equipped engine company um, if you want to have them within 15 minutes maybe that's what you're paying for now if you want them within 10 minutes and want to start get, getting into the recognized standards um, it's going to cost more right so um, that's one thing that we started years ago and with the 10-year plan over and the 10-year plan started i believe in 2001 and it was funded through a fire assessment and i did see that later on the agenda as far as funding mechanisms but the fire assessment was the the big aspect to, to that and uh, putting in a basically a uh, some won't call it a tax but most people do see it as such um as far as funding the fire side and um over that period of time we did have tremendous growth and in about seven to eight years we we stopped where we were with the fire assessment and, and stopped it at 165 dollars um, per resident the residents uh, home is what that was at the time um, because we had built up a reserve um, and with that reserve and uh, those years before we had hired 300 new firefighters in positions that was at a time when a lot of departments weren't hiring so uh, we were uh, very thankful blessed to be able to bring those people in um, and also we we built quite a few stations in that time but once we saw that we had done what we needed to do the it was wise that we stopped back and the board made a good decision a great decision and said hey let's stop what we're doing right now because we're we're already caught up and, and we don't need to continue with that so anyway that worked great for us Mr. Chairman, why, why are you guys going are you going away from volunteers or no, uh, no, we're not looking at going away. We're just looking at trying to enhance what we've got. And we've got a level of service situation where, just like the chief said, um, volunteers aren't out there like they used to be years ago, and they're not that committed. I mean, you know, they, they're getting paid so much a call, and do they want to give up their whole Saturday for $8 a call or whatever a call? Um, and that's, that's what we're facing right now. And we have a taxing unit right now that supports our our fire service, but it's based on ad valorem taxes. So you can imagine in Putnam County, our ad valorem's not that high. We are looking at going to a benefit unit, 
and hopefully that might help in the future. But I think that's what you currently have. Is that we have a couple different ways of funding our fire, um, but we have a mixture. One, one's a base cost per, per parcel. We have. Um, I don't remember what the number is, but it's 170 something right now. For the um, residential, it's 172 for the first time um, since we had. And then for commercial, stopped. by the square foot yes. and, okay. and all that other kind of stuff. So, right. And the, the good thing about the per parcel was is that during the recession, it didn't kick our fire department's butt. Right. You know what I mean? Where the millage rate drops through the you know right. the bottom of the tank, and you're you're in a lot of trouble. You have to raise the millage rate to compensate. So having that blend between the, you know a per parcel assessment and the millage rate was was pretty effective for us over has been over time and then the general fund is what funds the EMS side so now do you also have all the EMS for the entire county including this you know, all the municipalities yeah they yeah, don't ever give that up chief for me you want to speak to that <laughs> yes um, yes sir we do we've got eight ALS ambulances uh, position throughout our 807 square miles and then we have three supervisors one west one central one south that are also ALS uh, squads and uh, one thing too that uh, Chief Neville I'm sure is cognizant of I'm sure y'all are but ISO when you know in the level of service that he was talking about the lower your ISO rating you know to your citizens and businesses they they see the benefit of that you know tenfold really in the fact that their homeowners fire insurance and Commissioner Harvey's a, you know an insurance expert so I would defer to him on <laughs> the additional things but that is another another avenue to, to look at them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Commissioners any questions? Yeah. Oh just if I may. Um, Chairman Zalek, one thing that you'd mentioned about as far as the transport and giving it up, one thing that was also a success for us is uh, when you have your own transport, um, certainly you have a more of a community base and those citizens, whenever they have a complaint or whatever, they have a whole chain of command that they can deal with, with us with fire rescue as well as administration with the county or the county commission should they have any grievances. Um, with contractors, you may not receive the same. Um, service as far as uh, certainly supposed to get the same level of care ALS however if you have complaints um, we spend a lot of time talking to citizens and making sure that we're develop, uh, developing um, relationships with them of course in, in large groups and uh, your assisted living facilities which we are adding to uh, every day um, but also with our with a specific citizen that has a complaint we have people in our billing department that will spend a lot of time with them and um, we do our own billing we do that in-house and um, as far as an, a success story along with that is typically EMS doesn't fund itself as far as an ambulance service whatsoever um, when we we inherited basically the ambulance service in Marion County in around 2007 at that time there was a 20 million dollar budget for that and it was 11 million dollars in the red which was subsidized by the citizens. We took that and right now, and now we're running, I don't know what the percentage was on the calls, but um, I can tell you it's a lot more now because we've been jumping 5,000 a year, but now we're doing 75,000 calls with adding, without adding any personnel, 75,000 calls. We've gone from a, from a 20 million to a $17 million budget and we're 1 million in the red, as opposed to 11 million in the red. So. Uh, that's an outstanding uh, thing and actually uh, something to look at and remember and uh, consider and actually Lake County we've been meeting with, been meeting with their fire chief because they're looking at doing the same thing yeah, so we've done a great job just, on that side. just a trend and our, our people do a great job we have an 85% collection rate on our road. One of the other things too the chief has been spearheading for us is, is making sure that we can deliver you know better services in other areas one of the other pieces was with Chan's care in, in and around the villages, we were able to bring a helicopter to one of our fire stations by building a pad and doing some of that to help get some of the trauma folks, especially in that area that was underserved. Um, and then recently, we, we partnered with um, one of our local hospitals to have a, a critical care ambulance that can take the higher rated patients and be able to move them. So, and that's a partnership. We split that. Um, what's, what's the split? We basically split it 50 50, right? The, Hospital provides the nurses, and we provide the. Yes, sir. Um, we did split that, and I believe they bought the unit, 
as far as the critical care unit, the right. truck itself, is just a very large ambulance. Um, and of course, we have an RN, critical care rated RN, and two paramedics. One of the shifts is paramedic firefighters because um, we still allow them to be involved in that. Um, up until a certain point when we break even with revenues, then we will be sharing the revenue. Until then, Ocala is allowing us to uh, take the monies and put them towards the, the good of the, the system. And a great partnership with one of our local hospitals. You know, we're always looking for ways to provide better and better care for our mm -hmm. citizens, especially if they have to be transported. And you have some of those issues where sometimes you have to send a patient a long way. Um, and this helps them to be able to do that and deliver that kind of service without having to always take a helicopter. So. Before we get off this topic, Chief Romay, will you come back up? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. How many paid firemen do we have and how many volunteers? I want to answer that question. Uh, right now on staff, I've got 76, 78 AL on rescue on that side. I've got four uh, during the day, 8 to 8, Monday through Friday, uh, firemen at the two stations and we've had that for a number of years right. and now we are uh, you know working to augment the uh, the fire service with the first paid fully paid which will have four per shift on the engine to be a, a regional engine to to help augment you know this volunteer station around uh, where it's stationed at and of the volunteers we have roughly just under 350 on the rolls of that, we probably have 100, 115 that are somewhat active. You would love to change trade places, would you? <laughs> not to. It's a, <laughs> we'd love to be able to find that many volunteers. <laughs> we we have a great group of volunteers, and and I know Chairman Harvey uh, mentioned it earlier. We all are seeing you know a downturn in volunteerism. I'm in Rotary, you know, Fawanas. A lot of the, your your service organizations are just seeing that, you know, over time, where just people are looking for family life. And and uh, Chief Neville mentioned the you know the additional training and things like that. So yes, we uh, we're working very I'm, hard. I'm, I'm pretty impressed that you have that many volunteers with the, with the requirements. But they're, I mean, they're basically making. The requirements are making it very difficult for somebody to volunteer in the fire service. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make that as simple as possible. I know Chief Neville mentioned they're doing training. We're, we've got instructors that will have it at the fire station, at the emergency operations center, our training facility. We try to go to them, you know, or to a central location, and then we've got contracts with the FCTC, the burn building over there for all of the live fire training that we have to have because you have to have a certified uh, facility to be able to do that but we've uh, we've worked out all of those agreements ahead of time so not only can we take a class over there but if a fire station or you know a group wants to go over there with an instructor we can do that you know just with a little notice to the to the tech center so we're trying to do anything and everything to recruit and retrain you know everybody we can thank you Thank you, sir. You have a question. Question. Do you have a uh, impact fee? Transportation, fire, uh, or education? Impact fee on building. It's still, it's not working. One of you stepped really into it. <laughs> um, yeah, do you have an impact fee here? And out of that impact fee, how much? We just much? put a new place in. We just put a new, we, we suspended impact fees through the, um, the recession. Uh -huh. Transportation impact fees we suspended, and fire, and the school board had also, everybody had basically put a moratorium on impact fees through the recession, uh, and then this last last year in January this January this January we came in worked with our chamber worked with the business professionals worked with the builders we came up with a it's a limited impact fee so where the cost is about ten grand right. 10%. 10%. So, yeah, so we're charging them like 1500 bucks for a residential house. Our costs are probably, I think, around. It was about six to seven thousand. Six, seven thousand is what the real cost is. So but it's we're only. Gonna, we're going to hold, you know, slowly move that back up as a recession because one of the builders, and, and they were right, one of, when you talk to the appraisers, you, you, know, you can't put the impact fee plus their cost above what it'll appraise for, right? Right. So we're trying we're trying to find that middle ground and work on it. You know, I don't like impact fees. I don't think a lot of people love them, but we do need them to build the infrastructure for those things to work. I mean, it's, right. it's one of those. Things. And the state really, 
on the and the worst thing is that the state really limits us on the big developments on the on their pro rata share. It's not a true. It's not a true share. Well, what what, uh, what I was getting at? Oh, what is the percentage of your impact fee that goes back towards the emergency services, or is it put what into a lump sum? Impact fees? Is that what you're talking about? Or you're talking the, about transportation impact? So I'm just confused. I guess Steve wanted to know what the impact. Commissioner, the only impact fees we have in place is transportation impact fees. Okay. The fire so impact fees has been suspended, and we're not collecting fire impact fees. Okay. We used to do that when we were building stations. I think that's really a lot of that fund was used to build the 30-plus new stations we built, and we did that. During, that was part of the 10-year plan. But we're not building any stations. We're, we're building one, but it's been sales tax dollars. So we're, okay. not, we're not charging people uh, fire services. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Chief Romain? I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Just one follow-up question on the, the financing side. Um, you mentioned you're doing an MSTU, I believe, for fire service, or at MSBU, I'm sorry. Is there anything else that goes into that, or is the MSBU the sole thing uh, that sure. funds fire service? Chief, you know how all of it works? Yes, sir. It's um, a moving part. It's 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 well, there's a bunch of different budgets. Yeah, so. there's, there's quite a few budgets um, that we deal with. Our, our expert is back there in the back hiding. See, she's our CFO. That's Sydney Merrick. Have her come um, up and explain. Why don't you come up here? That'll be better. Uh, while she comes up here, I'll, I'll struggle through it a little bit. Um, <laughs> on our EMS side, we, we're so, and, and I'm sure, Chief, you understand, we end up that we can't fund some things with some dollars that we can fund with other dollars. And one of the things with the EMS is um, we have to utilize special funds. And, and part of that is a part of the, we get a portion of the millage for our EMS side, a portion of the millage that all the municipalities pay for ALS transport. That means the city of Ocala, even though they have their own fire department, they have. Um, they have first response um, fire rescue. They're very good at it. They got an ASO of uh, three. Uh, very good fire department. They got under 50 square miles. Um, so they, along with Dun Allen and all the city uh, or all the county, in unincorporated county, pay into the MSTU uh, for that. Um, you said the MSTU for that, the unincorporated area? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and that's also the municipalities. And also um, from that, as far as the, that's for more of the operational aspect. And then we have the one cent sales tax that was voted in this last year, which is four years that we can use for capital for those items. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. And so the general fund, so just to be clear, the general fund pays for ambulance, e services. ambulance services in the entire county because we're, we're pulling money from all the cities. Correct. And because that service is countywide, correct. The fire services, which are not countywide, they're correct. only in unincorporated Marion County, or with a contract we have with a particular municipality. Correct. Correct. How does that work? Tell okay. Us. The um, you're talking about the MSBU uh -huh. with the municipalities. Um, the only municipality that we don't contract with is Denellen and Ocala. Okay. For the 165, right. well, the 172 so now. We contract with one of our cities for that. Right? We do. Uh, Bellevue has that on their tax roll, and we and Reddick just passed that. I think it was a year yeah. or two ago. Yeah. Um, we do bill Macintosh for that EMS portion of the fire assessment. So when you have a fire assessment, it can only benefit property. It can't benefit the person. So if you have an ALS portion of your department you're probably gonna to need to also have an MSTU portion. So we have 0.77 mils that um, helps fund our MSBU. So it's a joint funding mechanism for only the fire side. Does that make sense? For parcel, it's 170. 172, 172 98, I believe it is plus, now. Plus the point plus there's a millage. Because the Florida State Code doesn't allow you to use Correct. emergency services under what you have property. You can't so use the assessment have a mixture, to provide EMS you have to have services. A, a dual rate, if you will. And basically what's going to happen is when you do your study to see how you need to fund that, they'll come up that whoever you use, we use GSG, they'll come up with the ratio of what your assessment and your millage needs to be. So right now we do have a study going on to look at whether we should do an MSTU or MSBU. Mm -hmm. We currently have the TU in place now. But what I heard you say is you don't want to get rid of your TU either because we're telling our citizens, or some of us have, that basically 
the BU will replace the TU, but you're recommending that does well, not happen. That's how we do it. That's how it you it's not necessarily, I don't think that there's one formula that works for everybody. You have to look at your citizens and the service levels that they okay. wanted. Um, that's how it was designed back in 01 when they did that 10 year study. And there was a um, lawsuit that was, um, I want to say, I think it was down in Lake County where they challenged that the MSBU funded e the EMS portion of the fire service. And so by state Supreme Court, you cannot fund your EMS with only your MSPU. That's what we found out. Mostly, you're, even mm -hmm. no matter what you try to do, you're going to have a per, per, portion of your unincorporated services that is going to do medical. Right? Yeah, if, paramedic if you in have, the fire truck, mm -hmm. whoever it is, you know, if, and if that person's staying at the fire station, when they do the audit, it automatically pops up, right? So you're going to have some portion that has to stay in this piece and some portion that has to stay in this piece by law. That's why we, we only right. have it that way because we have to. Right. And, and, and the study is what determines, we actually have GSG come in and look at our budget and we apportion out the portions of the budget that would be EMS through just the fire department. We're not even talking the ambulance service. We're talking just the fire department because all of our trucks are ALS licensed. And a lot of our guys are dual certified so that they can, mm -hmm. so even if they're, Most they're with a group of an engine and an and ambulance, those guys can go fight a fire if they're in an ambulance. You know, we have a certain portion of folks that are like that. And the county's public information office made this great graphic for us that really kind of explains how we're funded. So if you have any questions, you can just let us know and but this is a wonderful re representation of how we're funded and where the money comes from thank you commissioner any other questions no very good one thing on the um what cindy was talking about and actually her title isn't really cfo she's kind of like a cfo but she's uh, uh our administrative and, and budget manager um one thing as far as that 0.77 that was rolled back. It had been 0.83, and the commission had rolled it back um, towards the end of the recession or during the recession because we had, we had what we needed in reserves to, to work forward. So anyway, that had actually been rolled back to help the citizens as far as uh, needing their own bills. And kind of thing. So uh, it worked out pretty well for us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Chairman Harvey, so on your side, one of the things you want to talk about was some Ecotourism. It is. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have a, uh, Putnam County has kind of went into that arena many years ago, and Karen's been a big part of that in her group. Um, I actually kind of looked at it when it first happened and thought, that's not really going to take off in Putnam <coughs> County. But ecotourism has done a tremendous job in Putnam County. And um, Karen, I'd like for you to come up, since Sam's not here, and talk to us Talk to us about what the group does with Blue Rays and Trails. We have an active rail system, a CETA, a CETA loop that we're doing. and But just kind of mention those things that, that are really taking place in Putnam County right now. Well, I don't, I don't ride a bike, so I don't do any of the biking, but they have equestrian, an equestrian aspect and, and uh, they, they're biking the trails all over the place. Uh, there's uh, one of the Blue Ways and Trails members is, um, he plans kayaking trips like three times a week. He's always out there. <clears throat> he makes it very easy for, they have a Facebook page and, <coughs> and um, whoever wants to lead, a, uh, it's turned into whoever wants to lead a tour or put together a, a meetup, they just go on that Facebook page and they say, well, we're gonna do this and meet us here. And so it's, it's a community it's community run. It's not just a couple of people, but then they also bring in, uh, they have the, the different competitions. What is it? The Iron, Iron the Man? Iron, yeah. yeah. Iron, yeah. And, well, you've been involved in that yeah. actually more than I have. Um, would they stay up all night at the different? Yeah, they run all night in, in our Creek Forest. And I think it's the, your group, the Environmental Council actually has a disco ball set up in the middle of the forest with a, it's one of the Kevin. relief stations and they have a really, really good time in like, the middle like of Woodstock. the forest. Yeah, it's really, well, not like Woodstock. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't go to Woodstock either, by the way. More like a pit stop. <laughs> yeah, pit stop. Uh, yeah. But it's a pretty fascinating, and that had like a hundred and something runners that ran for 24 hours or something. Mm -hmm. and, I'm sorry? 
Yeah. yeah There's so several. They were very involved in the Duns Creek. Uh, people overlap in their groups. They were involved in the Duns Creek event on Earth Day, and there were a lot more kids there this year than um, the previous years. So more and more kids are coming out, and people are actually moving to Putnam County. They'll meet um, Gay and Kevin with the Blue Ways group and say, "This is great. You, know, you have all these things going on, and and we'd like to move here." So people are actually. That's great. Hey, Loretta, why don't you come up right, here? Right, the kayak, so hike a bike. Here. Kay kayaking, running, biking, hike a bike, yeah. Hike a bike, yeah. The Bartram but Trails, recently, yeah. Bartram St. Trails. St. John's County just had like 600 bicyclists over there that took tours into Putnam County daily. So it's a huge event for Putnam County, all the things that are going on. People staying in the hotels yeah. and, right. yeah. So they're definitely, and it's low impact. You right. know, they come and do their thing and take their trash and leave their money and, <laughs> and some people buy houses. I don't think they're they're building too much, which is good. They're buying existing houses, you know, along the river. Come on up. And I just wanted to correct one thing. I think earlier I said five thousand acres was being sprayed at Orange Spring. It's five acres, not five thousand. I didn't mean right. to say five thousand. <laughs> so Loretta is our TDC uh, director. Well, actually, BCB. Can't ever get all the names acronyms right. <laughs> Still learning. But uh, she takes care of our tourism in Marion County, so she'll, she'll talk to us a little bit about our ecotourism and what we're expecting and, and even how, that, how we're planning on tying that into Silver Springs and some of the trailheads. Absolutely. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, in addition to what our administrator rolled out is one of our key pillars within the strategic plan is, of course, ecotourism in general. And we, too, have seen a significant increase in um, not only the economic impact overall for tourism as a whole, but specifically as it relates to those outdoor adventures and ecotourism. Through our research that we conducted in 1415, we're actually wrapping up a whole other year of research, so we'll be able to see some benchmark numbers. But what we saw is through those key niche audiences that you all referred to, whether that was hiking, biking, trailing, sure. uh, birding, um, you know, uh, all of the hunting and whatnot, uh, we see almost a 40% of economic return just by way of those uh, visitors within those niche audience. So certainly something we are keeping on our radar. Uh, Silver Springs, uh, we too know, is, is, is a golden ticket in terms of our whole region and opening that up is a, is a mega attraction for uh, what it represents in the natural state. So, yeah, we've been very successful in that regard with uh, those various attributes and those niche audiences. You know, Mr. Chairman, we're seeing an actual, the heads and beds tax that we have, our Tourist Development Council. We can, we can host an event and within the next month see the spike and it could be softball tournament, it could be a baseball tournament, it could be a biking thing, it could be, I mean, it, whatever you want to see, you can actually see that going up. And our, our attorney would like more trails, wouldn't you? He mentioned that a lot. He would like somebody to cross the reservoir too, but he'd like more trails uh, out in the forest so he could just go out there and <laughs> blow off steam. It, am I not right? Okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, and I have to brag on our IT department, um, collaboratively working with uh, the engineering department with the Parks and Rec, we've been able to use our GS, GIS mapping system in order to uh, really map out not only some cool um, things from the equine related, but also the historic, but now we're moving into hiking and biking and how can we provide that experience so that once a visitor is on the trail and even when they're using like their handheld that they can move away from. So some real innovative things are, are going amongst various departments in our county that are really about collaboration and kind of using the resources and tools that can not only help our visitor base because we all prosper from you know the parks and the build out but also uh, you know accommodating for those visitors that are coming to town so they can experience and hopefully tell their friends and family so that they will not only come back but share with others our great uh, assets that we have in this region. Yeah. Thanks, Can I see any yeah. other questions? Water resources? We wanted to talk water resources today because water, as you know, probably we are in the water wars. And uh, we just had the meeting in Lachua County last Monday night, and that was a discussion we had there um, to maintain the water that we currently have. Um, there is some question about the situation we share with Rodman, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this one. It is 21 billion gallons of water sitting out there. 
And what I guess what kind of gets me a lot, and I'll make a disclaimer, I'm the executive director of Save Rod. Let's just put, put it out there, I am who I am. But when we were on the Senate floor the day with Hans Tanzler, who was the director of water management at that time, St. John's River flows north, and it's not that deep either. So evaporation happens in every pool of water that takes place in Florida. But we see, and we see this out in the West Putnam End, and we're seeing it in Clay County and Alachua County, that our water resources are, <coughs> are draining down. And our lakes, we've done studies on them to actually see that when we open the spillway and we let the water down for a drawdown, that our lakes go down. And it's proven to, to be the factual. So I think it's important for us to look at our water resources as a whole. And whether you like the reservoir or you don't, we'd never build that again. We all would admit we're never going to go across and finish it up. We're not going to want the saltwater intrusion in. We would never do what they did years ago. It just would not take place. But it's not accessible. And to think of it as accessible, when I took a TV reporter out there and I said, look, I'll drink out of the reservoir or out of the spillway if you'll drink out of the Jacksonville landing. And he said, I can't drink that water. And I think what's important is once we let that water go and it hits the river, you got salt water in the river, okay? The river is sea level. The reservoir is 19 feet above sea level. So I think there's some conceptions there that once we let that go and we're done with it, we're not going to get it back. And that bothers me because at the end of the day, I want all of our water to be up. But what I've seen in my, since I was a little boy growing up in Putnam County, and probably Kevin Saff, you're in the room, two o'clock every summer afternoon, you could go out to the horse pen and count on a rainstorm coming because it was happening that day. It's not happening like that anymore. We're not seeing those rainstorms coming like we used to see. So water is important. And again, whether you like the reservoir or not, we have a shared interest there. We also have the St. John's River. And pumping water out of that for developments that are huge down south is not going to benefit North Florida. We are the water re recharge area. We, I mean, you look at Putnam County, Clay County, parts of Marion, we recharge water, and if we don't have that ability to do that, we're not going to have water. So I'm just going to ask you to kind of keep your eyes open on that. But I don't mind having the meaningful conversation. Again, none of us would go out there and take drag lines and do what they did. Uh, manatees do go up into the reservoir. We got pods of them out there all the time. We have a habitat that's, that's second to none in some areas. But the argument is, well, now we want to build reservoirs to clean like a like Ochovia before it gets down to the Everglades. You got Jimmy Buffett standing on the Capitol steps singing the song about doing that. But yet, they want to tear this one down? To me, it makes no sense. And I know there's a debate to have. We'll have that debate. I don't mind doing that. But it, if it was a cesspool, you can believe you wouldn't have bass tournaments out there all the time like you have. And you wouldn't have manatees in there, and you wouldn't have eagles hanging around. Well, eagles are scavengers. You might have them at the end. <coughs> but for the most <coughs> part, it's 21 billion gallons of fresh water. I don't want to open that can of worms too big, but I guess we're kind of big. <laughs> um, what do you, you want our comments on? Well, that's, if you'd like to, yes, please. Sure. Why not? further in the month. Um, you know, it's been an interesting comment. You know, I went uh, a couple of years ago, um, and the funny thing about <coughs> environmental protection is that it's a really interesting process. And so I went, well, a couple of years ago when I was talking with, uh, uh, we, were, we were trying to do some work on the Oahu, and I was talking to the Army Corps of Engineers, and, uh, and I was talking to EPA, both of them, in regard to you know what the effect would be if we, if our parks were able to, you know, move some logs out of the way, or you know, some of the parks that we manage, how, how are we supposed to do that, and how can we do that responsibly, and 
how can we work with the Army Corps to, to move a tree stump if we have, you know, any of those sure. kind of, uh, you know, things. Um, and then I asked them about the Rodman, and it was kind of, it was really interesting. I think it really highlighted the process, especially from the federal government, um, in my mind, that, you know, they can they consider all of those things because it's been so old, um, and because it's been there so long, it's, it's created its own habitat. And that habitat itself would have to be replaced somewhere else or offset by something else or done by something else if you were to remove the reservoir. And so you have it. It's, it's, I, I would have never thought if you moved, removed a man-made thing, they would make you replace some of the other things that were going on from a, from a, uh, from a breeding ground, a fish ground, all these different pieces of the uh, philosophy. So. Um, and then on just the water side, you know, the plus is we have a reservoir. Um, and, and all of the people that want to take, you know, quote unquote, want to take water from the Akawaha, uh, and that have looked at taking up water from the Akawaha, the fact that we have a reservoir from that perspective is a, is a good thing. To, but I don't have all the answers. I'll just be honest. That's why Marion County really hasn't taken one necessarily firm position on either way. I'll tell you what, I've been out there both in the drawdown and the, and the up, and it's a phenomenal asset that Florida has. I, I don't know anything besides that, though. So. You good? <laughs> I can mention some else on one of the resources. Sure. I just want to point out that Florida is surrounded on three sides by something called salt water. So I would just encourage the counties that aren't here that are kind of on the coast, desalination might be a great idea. You know, especially some of the larger ones like Tampa, Miami-Dade, the ones that are having a lot of things. Tampa already has desal, but they need to support their own water and not try and take it from counties like Marion and Putnam. Just, just an idea to throw out there. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I have uh, away from Rodman, <coughs> Silver Springs. Uh, now, I, of course, you hear all sorts of things out there, some true, some aren't. But Silver Springs the level and quality is dropping. What I hear is because we're allowing a lot of pumping and water being sold and, and uh, taken out of our state. Is that any? Is there any basis to that? And what's the condition of Silver Springs? Well, the the, the truth is, is that the the quality and quantity are both down. And because typically what happens is because when the quantity goes down, so does the quality, right? You you, you, you right. collect more pieces to that. Uh, let me. Tracy is our expert, so <laughs> let me let me not step on my foot all the way. Um, <laughs> but. The reality is, are, are those things are down, um, and and there's but there and there's also been a long term, a very long term contract that Silver that Silver Springs Bottling Company does pull some water um, out for for bottling purposes, and they've had that permit for a very long time, and that's something commissioners a long time before I was ever here, you know, signed up and allowed, you know, them to use a certain amount of that water, so. Tracy can probably better. Before you go there, though, yeah. I heard an interesting concept the other day that even though they're bottling water out of there, it's still being used for human consumption. So it's not like it's going, it's evaporating or going somewhere else, or it's, we're drinking it, we're yeah. using that. Well, the misconception right here all the time is that why, why would the St. John's Water Management or any of the water management districts mm -hmm. give an okay to a bottling company versus you know, being able to make my, you know, and then put me on a water restriction, right? Right. That I can only water my lawn, you know, a couple times a month. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Well, it's because the value the, from the water management's perspective, one's for human consumption, and one is a, a want. Having green grass is not a need. Right. And so, from their perspective, they don't they don't want you overwatering your lawn and spending thirty or forty thousand gallons a month watering your lawn. Well, for the water management districts, they view bottled water as the highest and best use consumption because it's human consumption. So, Tracy, straighten me out on Silver Springs. <laughs> so, one of the great things is that our staff has been so great on water resources that DEP has allowed, uh, the only county in, in, in the state has allowed her and her team to actually build the BMAPs and the TM, TO, uh, TM, TMDL process. And so, She's done a phenomenal job as our county engineer in that regard. So, 
For the record, Tracy Straub, County Engineer. You're going to have to speak up, Tracy. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, Commissioner, the, the question, uh, Commissioner Zalek hit it on the head. Um, Silver Springs is actually in decline because of water quality and quantity issues. Uh, we are really in almost a 20-year drought. Um, the rainfall departure for this part of Florida is tremendous. Um, we are not seeing rains at, at 2 p.m. every afternoon. At, as a kid, I knew it. I knew I had to beat, beat it home before the, before the rain came. So um, we, we are, um, since the early 2000s, we are not getting the rainfall that we, that we used to get. You see a direct correlation um, in what flows through the spring and comes out the spring vents. Um, silver is actually competing against rainbow. Um, when, when we are getting good rainfall, silver outproduces. It's the largest uh, spring formation internationally and it would outproduce rainbow, um, was always recognized as the largest. Now, rainbow is actually pulling from the contributing basin to silver uh, just because of the elevations, and it's taking some of that flow away from rainbow. So the um, part of the BMAP exercise that we do, uh, both silver and rainbow have gone through the BMAP, um, which is a basin management action plan. Like Commissioner Alex said, DEP, uh, has focused on the first Magnet Springs, and they started with uh, four across the state, Silver, Rainbow, Wakulla, and Wakaiva. Um, so they were very focused in Marion County, and uh, my staff was allowed to uh, lead that effort. They hired consultants to do the other work. But um, what we found was we looked at where was the pollutant loads coming from. We talk about um, in Silver having a, a, a thousand year travel time to get to it, and we find that that's really not the case. We see water coming out of the vents, it can be about 40 years old. Um, so when we talk about that thousand year window, we, we reach all the way up into Alachua County and all the way down into Lake. Um, same kind of on the put, on the rainbow side, we reach over into to Levy and Citrus, more Levy so than Citrus. But um, we see that that water moves much faster. There's preferential pathways. So it's picking whatever we put it on the ground, um, it's picking that up and it, and it ranges the sources of the pollution. Uh, nitrate in an underground system Nitrate is what drives the growth of the, uh, the plant uh, material out in the spring. Surface water systems, we see that phosphorus drives it. Nitrate and phosphorus, they come from fertilizers, they come from manure, they come from human waste. Um, all of those things that we have just contributed to over time. Um, so that's where the BMAP has asked us to start removing uh, somewhere between 80 and 90,000 pounds of nitrate from the silver side and 80 to 90,000 pounds from the uh, from the rainbow side. Um, so that's we're all we're all working on that one right now. So, but that's also helped us to put in best management practices from from an agricultural side, from yeah. from, a, from a golf course side, from yeah. from all of those different perspectives, and including tasking us with figuring out how to do septic tanks better for our residential communities. So we're trying to. Every piece of that has a quadrant, and we've got to get better at all of them in order to be successful to That's keep correct. our springs healthy, right? That's correct. Every every piece, better at every piece. So we recognize people are going to fertilize, um, and and fertilizer works. It, it you know it does great things for your plants, for what we eat, vegetables that we eat. Farmers are producing more um, more product on smaller pieces of land. We know that they need to fertilize. We just ask that um, everybody, whether that's the uh, commercial grower or the, um, the, the the residential homeowner, be wise when you fertilize. That's one of our uh, PSAs out there. Be wise when you fertilize. Read the directions. Make sure you know what your uh, plants need. What they need. Little, little steps and big education program. We really work on an education program. Is it, if you were heading on it, but what was a common thought of when I was going to school was it took a thousand years to recharge our water in Florida and that is not no. they've 40 years yeah well that's what they're seeing coming out of yeah. some of the vents at silver we it, but um, some of them are faster, than them are faster. We've so got some pathways that are yeah with our weak Saint, so St. John's did a study um, my goodness it was probably 2012 uh, ish and um, and I can share that report of course with folks but what they saw, they put dye in, and you can only do this so often because you've only got so many colors of dye. So once you've used a color, you can't go back and use that color because you don't know what you're picking up from. So they put dye up at the Orange Lake sinkhole, and they, they um, you know, if you want, I actually have those numbers. Uh, they're back on my desk. How, back there. How quickly they moved, but they saw um, water moving very quickly, picking it up at the, uh, the wells at the Lowell Prison, 
um, in, in very short time frame. They put uh, dye at what we call uh, Pontiac Sink, which is on the south side of Ocala. There used to be an old Pontiac dealership. Uh, there's a, a Coons um, furniture store there at 31st Street and 441, and there's an old sinkhole um, back in there. They put dye in there. They saw that coming out of the spring vent rapidly. They put dye in at, um, at a sinkhole in front of the Appleton Museum. That popped up in no time at all. Um, so they did this dye tracer. They were only able to study it um, for about a year to go out every week. They'd go out and look for this dye showing up, and, um, and they would pick it up in different windows. Of, of time frames, but it, it definitely tells us there's a lot we do not know about what happens in that Swiss cheese underground, and there are just places that that water probably gets bottled up and hung up, and then there's places that that water just gets moving, and it just flows right out to those lower spring vents. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm happy to share that report with you. It is a very interesting. I like it, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Tracy. Yes, sir. Awesome job. Thank you. All right, the next thing on uh, Putnam County, we want to talk about transportation. Um, first of all, Mr. Tompkins, I'm going to have you come up and explain the forest roads and our decisions on why we did that. And, and commissioners, y'all have been down this road before. You think you're doing something good and there's always unintended consequences that come about. Um, and you just didn't, I apologize to the two in the audience that, from from your area uh, no we didn't notify and no we didn't come out and um, we sure we we've, we wish we had to right now so we're gonna mr. Tompkins if you go ahead and explain what what the situation is okay uh, press Tompkins uh, Putnam County Public Works director um, I hate to bring this up but this is one of the facts as everybody knows we just went through an audit one of our audit findings was our Forest Roads contract. Uh, we don't own the Forest Roads. They are owned by the Forestry Service. Uh, there was about eight or ten roads out there that we were paying uh, as a piggyback onto the uh, Forestry Service contract, Orange Springs Construction Company, to grade these roads. We were paying somewhere around 60000 a year for those, these roads to be graded. We had a meeting with the Forestry Service on another road, and they kind of asked us the question, and says, why are you guys maintaining our roads? We said, we don't know, we've just always done it. Well, you know, you just write us a 30-day letter and we'll take them back over again. And so we kind of came back and talked it over with our transportation committee and our commissioners, and we said, you know, with budget constraints and everything we're going through, we said, you know, that's, that's $60,000 we may be able to utilize somewhere else right now. So. We brought it from a board and we decided that we would turn the roads back over to the Forest Service for them to maintain. Um, it's kind of difficult at times to maintain something we don't own. Uh, we get that kind of drilled in our head that, that be very careful of public-private ownership. If, if we own the road, we do our best to grade it or, or take care of it. If we don't own it, they're private roads. There's not a whole lot we can do. So it's kind of those, one of those things that we did not have a valid contract to do this we had kind of been piggybacking over the last seven years up where we thought we had a contract but we never had put it in writing so we were trying to clean up some of the uh, suggestions that came out of the audit and get us back on track of what we should be doing so that was one of the reasons or the main reasons why we decided to turn the forest roads back over to the forestry service the forestry guy was supposed to be here today but I, I don't see him in the audience but unless he is I it? Okay. Um, but to touch back on what you just said, Orange Springs Contracting was doing the forest roads anyway. Correct? Yes, sir, they are. And they were doing them for us, but they just weren't doing them under contract that we knew about until we had the audit that proved we didn't have that contract in place. That is correct. Okay. Yeah, Orange Springs does, from what I've been told, they do several hundred miles a year of forest roads throughout uh, the forest area in this, this area. To satisfy the people that live over here, Mrs. Knowles and Mr. Sapp here, um, what can we do as the county to help them make sure that their roads are going to be maintained at the level that we contracted Orange Springs to do that? From my understanding and talking to the Orange Springs people, they maintain those roads pretty much the way they do the rest of the forest roads. They may not grade it every month, but they, I think they said they're on about on a six-week schedule. 
So they do all the grading. They add clay as necessary to keep the roads in, in decent passable shape. Uh, same, same thing that they, they charge us for. They charge us for the clay, for the grading, for everything. And states, I think we had about a $60,000 a year budget for that. Something, you know, something of that nature. So. Okay. But they told us they would maintain the road same, pretty much the same way they have been maintaining them. Um, yeah. Yes. No. Well, well, we were never doing it anyway. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. That I understood that that company, that Arnold Springs, was doing it anyway. Yes. And that we were just going to turn it over to the state to fund it rather than Putnam County fund it. So I was under the impression that the level of service should not change. Type of grading is the same grading guys that have been doing it because we we did not give them any instructions. They were basically instructed by the Forest Service. All we did was verify they graded so many miles of road we paid them for it. But they were under auspices of the Forest Service the whole time. Yeah. Yes, we do. Uh, if we can give you the name of the uh, uh, the contract. Hey, hey, hey guys, yeah. our, our clerk can't, cannot hear what you guys are saying from the audience. So if you, if you want to speak, if you could come up here to the podium. We need, we need you to take turns. I just want, you know, I can get that, Ms. Knowles, Ms. Knowles, uh, Commissioner Pickens, are you done with your question on that? Yeah, I just wanted to bring it up that I thought that because it was the same company, that the only thing that we exercised was to save the county $60,000 by allowing the forestry department to do what they should have been doing the last 10 years or so yeah. and, and that, that they would fund our springs to maintain your roads in a reasonable manner like the custom to see okay y'all got meetings on it when we met down in putnam county at the commissioner's office that's when we got it started they met with the forest service they came out there and the limbs was all down in the road and all that they talked to the forest service <clears throat> if it was okay if Putnam County came in and they brought them in and they trimmed the roads back. Then they came in and they put the clay and everything on the roads and they maintained ever, who was doing it. We thought it was Putnam County and they built it up. They widened it. We asked, we didn't ask for payment. We didn't ask for the other we wanted only two foot on each side of the road so that the road could be built up and two cars one going and one coming could pass and they did it and there's there should be meetings on that down in the Putnam County Commissioner's office when it happened and they did they came out and they fixed the road they did the runoffs <laughs> and the road is really good. But the last two times they've graded it now, they flattened it back out and they're pushing the dirt on each side of the road instead of building it up. But I was not aware that Putnam County wasn't over it until last week and I called Larry about it. Yes, you did. Miss Knowles, I think the best thing we can possibly do, uh, since the forestry guy is not here, as you he said he would be, is to bring that back to us on a transportation workshop. Mr. Tompkins, if you could get the forestry guy there, we'll get the neighbors to come back down and we can solve this in our chambers at that time. I really wish yeah. we would because I don't want our road to get back like it was. No, we don't want that to happen either. So. I, we lease our road from the Forest Service into our house off of 74. Okay. They're supposed to be keeping 66, it used to be 75, now it's 66 off of 19. You go down to 74, which is 
It used to be 77. <laughs> it goes all the way through to the boat slip down the, there. I know, I <laughs> well, they need to come out there because if, if it's fire starts, there's a big hole out in 74 down there that they couldn't even get a fire truck through. Right. Okay. So I think we can do this back at our transportation meeting. Okay. You know, I'm, you know, can get the I'm sorry, but no, that, no, no, you don't know, be sorry. That's what we're here for. That's I just want, you know, I just don't want it to get bad for the old people can't get out. No, I'm not think. old. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say one thing. Um, the trash trucks and dual wheel trucks, that's why we got Chip and Walton out there to fix the road. Them dual wheel trucks, as we all know, in sand don't do well. Right. And they couldn't get around out there. And they've been, they was tearing it up. Chip helped and Walton helped. And when they got on to help and put some clay in there, it's been great ever since. Okay. That had a problem. Well, we can work this out. I really but thank appreciate you. All right. Thank you very I'm much. Sorry, but no, I'm you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Um, I do want to mention. Jack, Barbara, I, about that. What was the road you were about? I got it right here. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Jack, you mentioned the uh, Black Bear Highway and you wanted to know why we were looking at paving yeah that's yes that's what we're going to be talking about it's called the black bear highway and it's going to be part of that 19 is and also that road 62 and 29 um 62 comes off of 19 29 is your fort gates ferry road right and, but it also part of it's in putnam right so no, so DO, FDOT asked us, Florida Department of Transportation, years ago about doing a paved road through the forest there. So in this agreement, the only roads we did not give back was 62 and our part of 29, okay? Chris, you wanna to touch base on where we're at right now too with that? And then I'll clean that up too. This, this, this is a, it's a long story. It's uh, a long story. But we, we got a DOT grant for what we call the Black Bear Highway. It's to do improvements on the east side of the river, our side of the river, up to the Fort Gates Ferry Landing uh, to pave that portion of the road. And we have a, uh, another grant to increase the actual landings of the ferry. That's another separate grant we're working on. They also said we need to include on the other side, on your side of the river, to, to go ahead and pave those roads. And we've been kind of merrily going along and we've hired a consultant and they're going through plans and specs and everything. And lo and behold, we met with the new forestry supervisor, whatever, and he said, he told us absolutely that we were not gonna pave that road. He said, we'll give you shell rock and that's it. So we've been going back and forth with him and back and forth with DOT about what we can do for funding wise if DOT will actually even fund a shell rock road. So that's kind of where we are right now. We're kind of twixt in between with this thing. Uh, we thought we were going to pave it, but the Forest Service now says there we can't pave it. So I don't know if we're going to do a Shell Rock Road or if we're going to leave it like it is. It's kind of up in the air right now. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, uh, concerning the rest of the conversation, there's always the rest of the story, as you well know. Now Congressman Yoho's office is involved in this, and uh, they don't feel like one person can decide what's best for us. The problem is we did not get enough money from DOT to pave the road from 19 down to Fort Gates Ferry. Um, it's part of our tourism, our economic development to bring people across the old ferry over to Wallaca. So we've asked Congressman Yoho to look at getting that road asphalted and finding a funded me funding mechanism to make that happen because if we if the guy says yeah we'll just do asphalt well, we don't have the money now just to do asphalt we've had to do every environmental study known to man go for turtles indian artifacts everything to get that and miss barfield you live down there at the end she knows um, we are we are really wanting to get this right because i tell you how many of y'all ever took the ferry across right there at fort gates ferry anybody in the audience really really cool if you haven't done the old Florida thing it's really neat now we are dredging out by the ferry landing because the barge is getting stuck in the silt right now with the river not being 
high enough. But we, we we are trying, but we hit the environmental uh, stone wall again, so we have to do an impact statement, and we have to do a revised submerged lands lease, and it goes on and on and on. So we we may get it done. You ever want to know why government so complicated? Sure. Doesn't seem to work that easy, right? But, but that is important to Putnam County, and Fort Gates Ferry has always been important, and and uh, we want to see that. I think Commissioner Pickens, you could have took the ferry across today. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, exactly. So Jack, that's why we were. That's why we're looking at that, and it's part of the scenic Black Bear Highway. And that's what they designated years and years ago. And so is 19, but so is that area because it takes you to Wallaca. And it was kind of interesting. We did a bear study. If you haven't done one in your county, we encourage you to do that. We did one in Putnam County. And I thought most bears would be located out in my area, West Putnam. Um, they're actually in the Wallaca area, um, swimming the river. They swim the river back and forth. So, yeah. I was told that water impedes the bears, but I can assure you they're swimming that river all day long. So. Yeah, okay. yeah, they're here. They're here. I know they're here. All right, Mr. Chairman, a few other things. I, the Planning Council in the DOT District, um, that's our fault. We left it on there, okay. and that was by mistake. Uh, the health insurance, we are going through a uh, considerable amount of growing pains right now with our health insurance program. And we'd just like to talk to y'all, uh, Marion County, about what you're doing as far as health insurance. So are there certain questions about health insurance that y'all have? Well. Are y'all self-funded? Yeah. So you're not no. on. Sure. There you go. You're on now. You're on now. I don't think so. Thank you, Mr. Biden. Okay. Go ahead. Again, Chairman, gentlemen, my questions are is if y'all are self-funding or not. We're not and, this time. And then what? Uh, we looked at it. What do you provide for your employees as far as coverage, whether it's 50 percent, 100 percent, and then options for their family to participate in and pay for um, spouse care and children? Sherry runs our program. She'll have all those answers. And Sherry Wiley, Risk and Benefits Manager. Um, the county's fully insured on their health insurance plan, and we offer three different plan choices to our employees. Um, we were the county's with Florida Blue. We've been with Florida Blue many years. We uh, do an RFP and we bid it out about every three years. But Florida Blue has continued to have um, pretty much the monopoly in Central Florida with the amount of providers and the discounts that they're able to do with um, the providers, which reduce our claims. Um, the county does subsidize a significant amount of the employee's cost in the health insurance. Um, we do offer a single plan and family option. So we don't have the four tier where you have single and then spouse and then um, employee plus children. It's either employee only or family coverage. We have reviewed that um, several different times and um, it's been the decision of the insurance committee and the board to remain with just the two tiers. But we do look at that, you know, usually every three years when we do our bid process to see, you know, what would benefit the county and the employees overall. The, the, um, ratio of contribution between what the county pays is looked at annually and determined you know based on what what uh, the budget is and what we um, present to the board but the county does does um, subsidize about 90 percent of single coverage and right now um, between 70 and 80 percent of family coverage that is being reviewed and looked at uh, again we'll be presenting um, this next year's renewal to our board over the next month or so. So that's looked at every year? Yes. Is that on all of your plans, ma'am? Is that, or is that just one plan? We have, we have one plan that is um, single coverage is cost zero to the employees, our health savings um, account compatible plan. The county does fund 100% of that plan. Um, that is our least uh, amount of, of employees enrolled in that plan. One of our um, strategies is coming forward is to try to educate our employees more on health savings accounts and the um, benefit of those to not only themselves, but their families and the tax savings to those health savings accounts. But um, we have one health savings account compatible plan and then we offer two other 
um, blue options PPO plans to our employees. Basically, we have the health savings account plan as we call our base plan. And then we have a middle option plan where the majority of the county employees are enrolled. And then we have what we call a more expensive type buy-up plan where employees do pay up more for that plan. Um, are you seeing tremendous increases in your costs each year now? We have in, in our cost. Um, we've had significant uh, increase in our high dollar cost claims. I think uh, from looking at all of our data, uh, the significant increases are in the um, drug cost, um, the uh, cost of you know technology and, and the new drugs that are coming out on the market is, is significantly impacting our, our costs. And if you don't mind, I have another. Um, health clinics, have you had an opportunity to look at those? I know I toured some around the state and also toured Alachua County's health clinic. Have you looked at those too? We have looked at it several years ago, and we're, we're in the process right now of also looking at it again. Um, we uh, have an employee health clinic at the county that's been in place, but it's not an, a personal clinic. It's an occupational clinic. And we have, um, we're looking at the possibility and potential of what, what would be the benefits and the cost of expanding that to be a personal employee health clinic um, for our employees and their families. We um, just had a presentation from HealthStat through the Florida Association of Counties and they came in and gave us a presentation of, of the clinics that they um, support through HealthStat. Um, we uh, went and, and toured the Pasco County Clinic that they just opened. Um, that was um, um, very enlightening. They, um, we ha I have not seen the Alachua County, but we are planning to, to go around and view some more clinics. But that's something that we will be looking at in depth and continuing to evaluate you know, whether that's, what, the, the thing to, to really consider is what is the best timing to do that transition and looking at your funding and how all of that's gonna play out with your budget and being able to do it at the right timing. Um, also, it, to, to reap the best benefit from those clinics, from what I've seen is, is you really need to be self-insured yeah. because then you're able to take in the benefits of the drug rebates and all of the other factors that the insurance carriers um, um, reap benefits from when you're fully insured, but when you're self-insured, you're able to, to, to reap the benefits of that. And so, so that's one of the things that we've also been looking at is when is the best timing for us to move from being fully insured to self-insured and being able to have enough reserves in place to fund and be um, called whole by the um, auditors and the, um, the um, people that come in and do your audits and your um, actuarials. You know what they found in Marion County is that um I mean, a lot of time, so, is um, it actually the health clinics found people who were unhealthy, mm -hmm. and uh, but then they got them in some type of health program, and you know, but it did drive the price up for a few years before they could get them through that system, right? Uh, because they weren't taking care of themselves. They didn't know they didn't have diabetes. They didn't know they had situations. Um, the county did a few years ago implement a Health Happens Wellness program that we're really proud of. Um, one of our, our major focuses of that is to encourage our employees to get a um, personal health assessment each year and to get established with a doctor and have their blood work done so that they can do that um, personal health assessment and get the counseling and hopefully if they get established with a doctor then they start to um, you know take care of themselves and identify those, those um, costs and those conditions before they become a high cost claim to us. We um, have had our wellness program in place for about three and a half years now and we've seen um, a difference in our employees and in the um, identifying some conditions. Yes, sometimes it does up your cost at the initial because people are going to the doctor more, but um, if you can save one of those one of those people's claims from being a high dollar expensive claim, not only for them but for your group, you know you've won. So that's right. So that's something that we're really focused on. We and did a really good job. I mean, our insurance, mm -hmm. um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, right? They pay for they actually pay for the wellness coordinator. Right? Yeah, as part of our renewal and part of our annual contract, they actually time. fund a wellness coordinator oh. position through our insurance agent, and so that position is, is actually employed through our insurance agent's company, but Blue Cross funds that through them, and then they also provide us annual wellness dollars to go toward our wellness program, and we negotiate that each year with our renewals and our contracts. Commissioner Pickett. 
Yeah. Awesome job. Thanks, Sheriff. Yeah, so yes, thank questions. you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that's the end of that. We've already talked about our funding on the fire service, so we took care of that in the beginning. So I believe that's the end of our comments on this side. Okay. Excellent. Commissioners, anything else? No? All right. We're good? Well, I'd like to make a closing comment. I really want to thank you for your leadership and for the board to meet with us today. Uh, it's been very enlightening to go around and meet with our partners and our neighbors. And for that, Miller Blueberry Farm donated blueberries wow, to awesome. each of y'all. And you get a county pen from Putnam County. That's uh, great. Lapel pen for your lapel. Oh, right. so, but Kathy's not here, so she doesn't get blueberries. Well, so. she's not getting blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring them up. You're welcome. And we do a pre. Commissioner Pickens, any closing comments? No. It is. We can't hear it. We can't hear it. Just here. Yeah, I'd no. just like to thank uh, uh, Chairman Harvey and then Chairman Zellick uh, for arranging this, and uh, I think it's very productive. Sorry I was late, uh, but I think I did have one of the longest drives. So, and I should have taken the ferry, but I didn't want to take the chance that it would be on the on my side, so I have to wait for it. And uh, and also, and I can just tell a story, um, Commissioner Stone, I uh, saw her at the ethics uh meeting uh, right after we got elected and i looked at her and i said Kathy, i know this young lady and uh but i just i was you know didn't go up to her and ask her if she'd ever been in crescent city but a long story short um i saw her at uh, certified county commissioner training in elijah county and uh, when she introduced herself i figured out who she was and uh, she came to crescent city uh, michelle what some 30 years ago Yes. As a young banker and uh, married the, probably the most eligible bachelor in town, uh, <laughs> Charlie Stone, because I was already married. <laughs> <laughs> well, there so you go. Anyway, and uh, Charlie actually came to Crescent City in 1980 uh, when Miller Enterprises, if you would remember, the Handyway brand convenience stores, uh, they were based out of Crescent City, and that's where they started. They purchased my dad's uh, oil company to start with the self-serve gasoline um, and brand it um, for their handyway stores. And Charlie came to run that. Uh, Charlie was very instrumental uh, with me in Rotary and was uh, a mentor. And uh, he is now a state uh, representative. Uh, and I don't know if uh, Charlie was there when my brother was there. My brother was former state representative Joe Pickens. He was there uh, representing District 1 from 2000 to 2008. So, but anyway, thank you for arranging this meeting, and I hope to meet y'all uh, after the meeting, hang around for a few minutes. Thank you. Mr. Gutter? Well, I couldn't top that story if I tried. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. But thank you, everyone. It is so nice to see this many people at this joint meeting, and thank you for allowing us to come over here. Yeah, and sure. uh, I mean, we should be working together. We are neighbors. Absolutely. So it, it, this this is very pleasurable. And Chairman, I want to say thank you again because we're the one that brought it up and thought we should have. It. I was like, well, that's a great idea. I don't think we've ever had a joint meeting with another county commission. And, you know, at the end of the day, we, we end up meeting a lot at FAC, but. Sometimes we don't get together, all of our staffs together, ask each other different questions, find out good ideas, and be able to help serve our communities better. So thank you for your leadership. Sir. Thank you, sir. I just want to thank um, this local VFW post because I have been in here before. Yeah. And they, they, they knew who I was and they let me back through the door, so thank you. <laughs> but seriously, we'll thanks for soon. opening up your facility to, for us to have this joint workshop. It's so appreciated. And also thank you for your service to our country as veterans. All right. So no further comment. We'll be adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.